All right, so the message for today is the goodness of God. I, I kind of uh, alluded to it last week, the goodness of God. We've been talking about the omnis. This one was omnibenevolent, all good. The goodness of God. We, we sang a song just a few moments ago, the good, good father. Uh, we also have another song, I think we might have sang it last week or week before, I think, goodness of, uh, the goodness of God. We sing about the goodness of God. We talk about the goodness of God. So now we're going to take a look at what does it mean for God to be good. So the scripture reading uh, for today is out of Luke 18 verses just verses 18 and 19 so I'm going to read from from those verses and a ruler asked him good teacher speaking to Jesus what must I do to inherit eternal life and Jesus said to him why do you call me good no one is good except God alone let's pray Father God, we do thank you so much for allowing us to come before you. We, we see um, outside the, the rain coming, and we know that you, that you rain on the just and on the unjust. Um, we thank you again for the, the rain that, 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 brings, that brings life and, and grows the things around us. Um, we thank you again for keeping those that are able to be here today safe uh, as, they, as they, they traveled in, in the weather. And we ask that you would see them safely back home um, when, when uh, our worship concludes. We thank you again for all the many blessings that you've given us. We thank you for the ministries that you've given us to put our hands to, the people that are going to going to walk through these doors that we get a chance to share the, the love of Christ with and that uh, there are those that, that do not know Jesus that, um, that we would be used to be an introduction to, to him, his, his love and, and the salvation through him. I thank you for the word this morning. I thank you for the message that you've given me. I pray that these words always are yours uh, and they're not mine, that you would use me boldly to share and that you would open up hearts and minds to what you have to tell us through, through your word today. And as the psalmist says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the omnis, the omnis, om, omnipotence of God, all-powerful, the omnipresence of God, God is everywhere, the omniscience of God, God is all-knowing. We've looked at the holiness of God, holy meaning set apart or sacred, uh, that we, we learn that God is holy, he is completely other, okay? There's, uh, we learn that there's a, a differentiation between the things that are of the world and the things that are sacred. It was, the world was profane, and what God sets apart is he deems as sacred. He has set things apart for his own use. Um, we learn that God is holy, that he is completely other than anything else. God is holy and he marks us as being holy when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. He sets us apart from the rest of the world. Holiness is a state of position. It's not a state of morality. Okay? You're not holy because you're more moral than anybody else. You're holy because God deems you as being holy. We learn that, that God is eternal. He is blameless. He's sinless. His justice is perfect. And God always does what's right. That's what it means when we say about righteousness. And all these things are his characteristics. And all these things go under the umbrella of holy. And good, or goodness, is part of that. We learn that God is sovereign. That he made everything and everything is under his will. And today we're going to look at God being all good. Does anybody remember, I, I heard this on, on, the, on the radio or on one of the, 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 the pastors. Uh, does anybody remember the first prayer that they ever learned? Does anybody remember like learning how to say grace when they were a kid? 
Did it sound something like this? Because I remembered this, right? God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. We always used to say that as kids. That was uh, our turn to say grace. And that's what we said. I don't know, does anybody remember that? I saw some, some acknowledgments, all right? Yeah, all right? When we say that God is great, what did, what did we mean by that? We were just kids, but when we say that God is great, it means that he is above all things. He's preeminent, to use a, a nice long word, over, over everything. It doesn't mean that we're comparing God to creation in any way. He's set apart, but he is above everything else. He is great. When, when, when we say that God is completely other, there's nothing to compare him to. When we say that someone is great, there's a nice new term that, that they use, the greatest of all time, in quarterbacks and pitchers and athletes and so forth, being the greatest of all time. When we say that someone is great, we can only mean that they're great as a shadow of the greatness of God. And when we say that someone is great, we're comparing them to others around us. Someone as a great quarterback is only being compared to other quarterbacks. What do we mean when we say that God is good? Or what do we mean when we say that anyone is good? Or anything is good? What do we mean by that? Someone can be a good musician, good piano player, good guitar player. Someone could be a good singer. Someone could be a good cook. There's lots of things that people, we say, are good at things, right? We can also say that something tastes good. We could say that something looks good, right? We could say that something feels good, right? But those things are worldly. But what do we mean when we say that someone is good? What do we mean when we say that God is good? We sang that song, you're a good, good father. What do we mean? What do we mean by the goodness of God? When we say that something is good, we're comparing it to some standard of goodness, aren't we? You can taste certain things and you say, well, that tastes good, that, that tastes terrible. Now, that might be your own prejudices about things, okay? But you're comparing it to something else. What do you define as a standard of goodness when it comes to, say, something like pizza, right? Certain pizzas are better than other pizzas, right? That's a good pizza. That's a bad pizza. It's your standard. So. It brings up this question. Again, what do we mean when we say that God is good? By what standard, if any, are we saying that God is good? Does God, in fact, answer to a standard? Does he answer to a higher standard? Right? Is there some standard of good that God must adhere to? Is there some standard that God is under? Is there some cosmic law that's out there, I think to use R.C. Sproul's description of it, that God must obey? In our reading for today, this rich ruler, as he's described, he addresses Jesus as good teacher. What did this rich ruler mean when he said that? Now, a rabbi of that day would never refer to himself as good. He would never put that title in front of his name. He would never refer to himself as a good rabbi because the word good is, was always reserved to God and God alone. In the teachings of that day, only God would be good. Now, to be sure, 
the question that, the, that was foremost on the rich ruler's mind was, what must I do to uh, uh, inherit eternal life? That's what he wanted. And he may have thought that he was buttering up Jesus somehow by saying, good teacher. But he wanted to know how to achieve eternal life, how to inherit it. Now, isn't that, that's the question of the day, right? How do I, how do I inherit eternal life? But Jesus, as he often, often does, is he bypasses that question altogether for a moment. And he instead asks his own question. He asks the rich ruler, why do you call me good? In other words, to use the Harold version of scripture, the revised Harmon standard version, he's saying, you call me good, do you even understand what good means? Do you understand what it means to be good? Now, Jesus is not saying that he himself is not good. Jesus tells us only God is good. So really what is happening in this question that the rich ruler says is the rich ruler was correct in calling Jesus good teacher. It's just that he didn't know why he was calling Jesus good. He didn't make the connection that Jesus was God. See? So he's looking at, at Jesus and he's calling him good teacher, not recognizing that Jesus is God. God is good. Jesus is good. Now, in today's world, people and probably back then as well, perhaps, people will protest the idea that only God is good. The prevailing attitude with many people in this world is that everyone is basically good. You hear that all the time. I'm basically good. I think people are basically good. You hear, I can hear that over and over and over again. But by whose standards are they making that call? How are they making that statement at all? What are they using to determine that people are basically good? In our society, we are constantly judging people, others, by an ever-shifting standard of goodness. Things that are considered good today were not considered good decades ago, or years ago for that matter. Now all of a sudden things are good. So we have this sliding scale, this sh these shifting sands, and we re redefine what it means to be good. So we have this relativeness of what we decide is good. When I was in high school, I was in the chess club. I wasn't an athlete, I was in the chess club. And I happened to play on our chess team. And we used to play against other schools in the area. We actually won the area championship one year, and for punishment, they left us out of the yearbook. <laughs> At that time, I was probably considered a good chess player. Skills have eroded a lot since then, but it was a fun time. But at the same time, at that same year-ish, Bobby Fischer, you may know that name, maybe not, he was the world chess champion. He was probably, I guess, the greatest chess player of all time at that time. Bobby Fischer was considered a good chess player. But relatively speaking, to use that word again, you would be making a mistake if you thought that his skills and my skills were equal because we were both considered good. 
I happened to have an opportunity to play against someone. Bobby Fischer was a grandmaster. I had an opportunity to play in a simultaneous match with someone who was an international master. There was about 30 other players in the room, at least 30. And he would move from board to board to board to board, making a move. And then you had all that opportunity to, to think about what your next move was. I can, get, I can tell you this without shame, that I got about 10 moves into the game and I was done. I, I had no chance against this guy. It was very obvious that I was not as good as he was. So from a secular or a worldly perspective, good or goodness is relative. So I'll ask you the question, who are you comparing yourself to? When someone says that they think that everybody is, most people are, are basically good, that's the question. So what are you comparing that to? If you think that you're basically a good person, what's the standard that you're using? Consider the Pharisee and the tax collector. I always love the, the, that comparison, right? We, we talked about this at, at our group, and I think we mentioned this many times from the pulpit, right? The Pharisee is there, and they're both praying, and the Pharisee is listing all the reasons why he considered himself good. And to seal the deal, he looks over at the tax collector and compares himself to this guy, this loser, and says, I'm not even like him. I am so much better than he is. The Pharisee is comparing his goodness to somebody else. When we judge ourselves as good, we're basing that upon our own standards. Or worse, we compare ourselves to someone else. I may not be perfect, but I'm not as bad as that guy. It's relative. Jesus tells the scribes and the Pharisees, who thought themselves as being righteous, he's told them that they were nothing more than whitewashed tombs. They appear outwardly beautiful and white and clean, but inside they're full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. Isn't that us? I know you were supposed to be uplifted this morning, right? After all, it's, the scripture says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When we step out into the world, don't we often show our clean side? That white washed tomb side? Our best works are good only in a relative sense when we compare them to others. As believers in this room, we run smack on into Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Can we do that for five minutes at a stretch? All of our attempts at goodness must be motivated by Deuteronomy 6.5. But as fallen sinful human beings, we can't achieve that level of, of love. Can we do everything that we do with, all, with loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? That's a tall order. So, what does it mean then when Jesus says only God is good? I think we can establish the fact that we're not. We're being sanctified, we're growing. God is, is sanctifying us into the image of Jesus. But as long as we wear these, this human body, we're going to fall short. So, what does it mean for God to be good? First, goodness is part of God's nature. God always acts in accordance with his nature. He cannot do anything outside of who he is. He can't contradict himself. He can't do something that is against his nature. God will always do what is true. He'll always do what is right. 
He'll always do things for His glory. God cannot do anything that is untrue. He can't lie. He can't be unrighteous. God is the standard of all that is good. Of all that is good. This is a very hard, complicated topic. In fact, last night Joan and I were praying and I said, I said, I really think that I bit off more than I can chew to do this. But God is the standard of all that is good. There's no evil in God. God cannot, be, cannot sin. He cannot be tempted to sin. Scripture tells us that God is good. The reading for today in Psalm 100. When God saw, after he created everything, he saw that it was good. We were in the garden, and sin came into the world. And Adam and Eve sinned. Why? They were created innocent, but they were created with free will. They were created with the ability to choose. And here comes the, really the, the crux of everything. Because it would be safe to say that if we were in the garden at that time, we would have sinned as well. We can't hold Adam and Eve, we can in one sense, but we can't stand here or sit here and say, if I was in the garden, I would have stopped Eve. I would have said, yeah, what do you, what do you think you're doing? All right. Now, last week, I ended with this. We were talking about the omnipotence of God, the power of God. And I asked this question, I said, with all that power, with his sovereignty, with his omniscience, with his omnipotence, we are faced with the problem of evil. And actually, that's really what started this whole um, desire or this, this, um, um, this message that I believe that God wanted us to talk about because of the events that have been happening in the world, starting with Texas. People ask this question. If God is all-powerful, why doesn't he stop evil? Those recent shootings, why didn't God stop them? Then the question then becomes is, if God can't stop evil, then he's not all-powerful. But if he is all-powerful and he chooses not to stop evil, then he's not good. So the argument then becomes, why doesn't God use the, his power when we think that he should? Habakkuk asked that question in his book in the first chapter. He says, why do I have to look at what's going on here? Why do you look down at this and see what's going on and do nothing? That question is being, is, has been asked throughout Scripture, primarily in the Psalms. If there's evil in the world, or pain, or suffering, and God allows those things to happen, can God really be good? Now, Scripture says that God will give good things to those who ask, right? Who, if, who, if, if you're a, using good father as the example, if you were a father and your, and your child asked you for a, a bread, would you give him a stone? Right? Everyone who asks, receive. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. The one who seeks, finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil, there we are, right? Know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? It's a good question. Is God morally obligated to give us blessings? 
I see some heads that are shaking, though. If God was truly all good, wouldn't it seem necessary that God would only allow good things to happen? Let me tell you something. I think as church, as believers, as Christians, I think that we have to have that answer for the world that's out there. But we have this problem, and it's called sin. How can we expect God to shower us with blessings when we commit sin? I mentioned the Psalms. Read through the Psalms. It's, they're a great read. There's, there's an emotion for every... There's, there's a Psalm for every emotion, if you read it. There's Psalms of joy. There's Psalms of sadness. There's Psalms of lament. There's Psalms of pain and happiness. And a good many of those Psalms ask the question, why? Why are these things happening? In Psalm 73, it begins this way. I love this. He says, Asaph, who wrote this, Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Why do the wicked prosper is the way that it is often asked. Asaph, who wrote this psalm, he struggled. He looked out at the world and asked that same question, why? And he says, my feet almost stumbled, I almost slipped, I almost forgot. Verse 1. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. One commentator, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he puts it this way. He says, God is good and nothing but good to his people. We often say it this way. God is good all the time and all the time God is good. We say that. Do we know what that means? What does that look like? So now the question comes back is, what do we do about this question of evil? What do we do with what happens down in Texas? Well, let's think about what God could do. He could, could intervene. He could change everyone so that we would not sin. Right? He could do that. He could change every one of our hearts so that we would never sin then we would be robots. God could change us all so that we could only do what was right. He could do that. He could take away our free will, our ability to choose. Again, Adam and Eve were innocent, but their free will allowed them to choose between good and evil. We live in a world right now where we can choose. We can choose our actions, but we can't choose the consequences. For Adam and Eve, their choice affected all who came after them. When we sin, our actions have consequences. Sin impacts us, it impacts those around us, and it often impacts those that come after us. Consider God again. He could have stopped that shooter from going into the, into the school. He could stop a drunk driver from getting into a car. He could stop the car from starting. He could stop someone from going into a store and robbing it. He could do that. He could have stopped the terrorists from flying jets into buildings. He could have done that. And this all sounds really good on the surface, doesn't it? But where would you like God to stop? You see, all of this sounds like a good idea until God prevents us from doing something that we want to do. 
Where does God draw the line? He could have stopped, not just stopped the drunk from getting into the car, he could have stopped them from having a drink in the first place. He could stop us from cheating on our taxes. He could prevent us from driving over the speed limit. Where would you like him to stop? We could ask the question this way, why doesn't God just stop the really evil things and let the not so evil things go by? Where do you draw the line? Why doesn't God just simply judge all the evil things or all the evil people and just remove them? I think I say this all the time when I watch the news. Why can't just God just come and just get rid of all these people? And we would be fine. But we wouldn't. Because we would still be here. Now there will come a day when God will judge. He'll judge sin. He'll remove evil. And he will make all things new. But in the meantime, we choose our own way. And then we blame God for not doing anything about it. Now, to be sure, God does restrain or stop some acts of evil. I believe he does. Because this world would be so much worse if God did not restrain evil. You think about that. This world could be a heck of a lot worse than it is right now. Because it's our natural bent. When we choose evil, God allows us. And unfortunately, when we choose evil, he also allows those around us to suffer the consequences. God's goodness is an essential characteristic of his holiness. Remember, holiness is God set apart from all of creation. God is his own standard. God, again, cannot do anything against his character. His justice is perfect. Sin will be punished and is punished. And to do otherwise would go against his moral character. If he did nothing about sin, eventually, it would go against his character. And sin was punished. It was punished on the cross in Jesus Christ. And we are saved through God's judgment in Christ. His justice, God's justice, was not compromised because he accepted the penalty that Jesus took. God's goodness, to kind of wrap this up, God's goodness is displayed in his mercy on us. Remember, mercy is receiving what... Mercy is, is, is not receiving what we, what we deserve. In other words, you deserve punishment, you don't get it, you've received mercy. Justice is receiving what we do deserve. All right? The penalty of sin for sin is death. Justice would be us receiving that penalty. Grace, on the other hand, is receiving what we don't deserve. So look at it this way. Again, the penalty for sin is death. That's justice. Jesus died for our sins. God's justice is served. Mercy is not receiving the penalty of death because Jesus already received the penalty. And grace is the gift of eternal life. When God accepted Jesus' death as payment for sin, the gift of eternal life is God's free gift in grace to us. But that doesn't mean that there's not consequences for sin. Romans 8.28 tells us, For we know that those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Paul is not telling us that a Christian's life will be free of trouble. Amen? Right? Amen. But here's what we do know. Is that God is continually working out all things. It says, for those who love God, all things work together for good. That verb in there is God's continuous work. 
It's not, it's not like God is looking at his calendar and looking at his schedule and saying, okay, now I'm going to work things out. He's constantly working things out. He's continually working out all things, all things, everything, everything that happens to your, in your life, including the sins of others that would affect you. He's working those things out for good. In Genesis chapter 50, when Joseph was speaking to his brothers, we won't go into the story, but he said, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Joseph had to go through a lot of stuff that maybe, I don't think it happened to Joseph, but maybe for any one of us, we might be looking at it and saying, God, I don't see the good in this. But Joseph knew that there was going to be an eventual good. And he trusted in that. Psalm 73, I'm just going to re, re, go rewind to that a bit, right? He was envious, Asaph, was envious of the arrogant when he saw the prosperity of the wicked. And he wanted to know why. And he said, my, my, my feet almost slipped. I almost stumbled. And then he realizes, in verse 16, go back and read Psalm 73. He says, but when I thought on how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. I looked out at the world and I couldn't understand this until I went into the sanctuary of God and then I discerned their end. God will work this all out. This is what we have to trust. And this is the goodness of God. We can't understand goodness from a worldly perspective. It's a worldly standard that we want to continuously use. Okay? But here's what I'm going to tell you about God's goodness. Ultimately, he has our good in focus. And he has his glory in focus. And what is our good? All right? You sit there and you say, what good is going to come out of all this? I can tell you what's going to come out of all this. Your salvation. We might not see the good in any given situation, but rest assured, for those that are called by God and who love God, He's working all things out for our good. Psalm 34 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him. Take refuge in the fact that you have been set aside for His good, His salvation, and, or your salvation, and your eternal life. And where do we know this from? We know this from the gospel. Why is it called the good news? It's called good news because it's good. God's going to deal with evil. He's going to wipe away every tear. And he's going to make all things new again. But ultimately, the goodness of God is his plan to redeem us. To bring us back to him. And then for all of eternity, we're going to live in that place of goodness. That's the goodness of God. If we're expecting, in a lot of ways, for just everything to just be good and not have any problems and everything is just going to kind of coast along until it's time for him to, to, to take us home, well, maybe might, that might be his plan. But ultimately, his goodness is seen in the gospel of Jesus. Our salvation is the goodness of God. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you so much for allowing us to come before you. We thank you for this beautiful day. We always thank you for another day of life that you have given us, another day that we get to, to come here. Uh, every day we get to open up your word and to, to visit with you and to, to hear what you have to, to say to us and to speak to us. Um, we, we thank you for all the things that you have given us, the, the, the gifts and the talents that you have blessed us with, the things that you've allowed us to put our hands to in, in, for your glory. As as we await Jesus' return and the time that, that he takes us all home. We thank you again for 
each other. I thank you for this, the message this morning. I pray that, as always, that these words were yours and, and not mine, that I did not do damage to my soul. And I pray for each person here that you would continue, continuously grow each of us into the, into the people that you want us to be and that we would we'd be able to go out and in, in, in confidence and in the power of the Holy Spirit to, to share that, that good news to a, to a lost world. We thank you again for, for this day. May we always be good stewards of all that you've blessed us with and use everything that you've given us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.